Hi, this is the Bet Central podcast. Let's make some profit. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the latest episode of Zach Lowy's European Football Show. I'm your host, Zach Lowy, and I'm here today with two brilliant guests. Uh, we've got our first Peruvian guest, as Luis Michel Echegaray joins us from London. Luis has been working with ESPN since September 2022. Since then, he's had the chance to interview Lionel Messi and regularly appear on SportsCenter. It's a pleasure to have you on, Luis. How are you doing today, and how have you been enjoying your first year at ESPN? Thank you for the intro, my friend. It's, it's been great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm jet-lagged, everybody. I uh, just arrived, as you said, to London from New York. I've been here since September, but had to go back to NYC in Connecticut. My wife's American, so and we live there uh, for Thanksgiving and stuff. But I'm good. I'm wearing my Aston Villa uh, uh, sw- in-house sweater pajamas. That's how tired and excited I am to be here. So it's a pleasure. And ESPN has been fantastic, as you said. Lionel Messi interviewed him this year. And Unai Emery I interviewed him this year, which I think is more important. <laughs> um, I'm also incredibly excited to have football data analyst Ben Griffiths, who joins us from Washington, D.C. How are you doing, Ben? And how was your Thanksgiving? I am doing well. Thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. Uh, Thanksgiving was good. Uh, yeah, it's just 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 long enough to enjoy the time off, just short enough to not really fully feel like you're fully off. So um, back back to the real world today, and, and excited to, to be here. Have you finished off all the leftovers, or you still have some you have to make your way through this week? <laughs> we um. So my wife made a uh, uh, little. What are they called? Um, like the little. Uh, game hens and so we didn't have a big turkey to then finish off we each had an individual little hen that was much simpler to finish and then i don't leave any mashed potatoes uh, i think that's probably illegal to leave mashed potatoes left over so those all were in me interesting cornish game hens very very interesting one ben uh guys, a little bit easier than a turkey so okay. <laughs> we've got a lot to discuss today but i want to start by going over the action in Ligon. Uh, one week after winning their first match of the season, Lyon fell to a 2-0 defeat to Lille, with Jonathan David and Thiago Santos giving them an early lead, whilst Montpellier suffered their first home defeat since August and fell to a 3-1 loss to Brest. It's been 17 years since Gennaro Gattuso and Patrick Vieira faced off in midfield in the World Cup final, and on Saturday, they, they reunited in Strasbourg. Kevin Gamero set up Emmanuel Emega's opener in the sixth minute, but Jonathan Klaus would level proceedings for Gattuso's Marseille shortly after in a 1-1 draw. Julian Stefan spent three years in charge of Rennes, leading them to a Coupe de France victory against PSG, ending a 48-year title drought and qualifying them to the Champions League for the first time ever, but he would depart in March 2021. Two and a half years later, he is back in Brittany after replacing Bruno Genesio during the international break, and he guided Ren to their first league win since October 1st with Amin Guiri, Benjamin Bourijod, and Arthur Theat uh, finding the back of the net. Ren end a cold streak of one point in five matches, whilst Rem fall to a second straight defeat. They'll be looking to bounce back next week with a, with a visit from Strasbourg. Metz took the lead within a minute, only to cough up the advantage before the break, but they equalized in the 65th minute and secured a 3-2 win in Lorient, with Ablier Jalot scoring a late penalty. Nice became the first team in Liga in history to not trail at any point during their first 13 matches. They have the best defense in Europe with just four goals conceded. They have not let in a goal since September 15th. Aston Villa Loney, Morgan Sanson found Terra Mofi for the winner after halftime as Nice edged Toulouse 1-0, whilst Le Havre picked up their fifth goalless draw of the season, including their fourth goalless draw in their last five. Andre Ayou made his debut for Le Havre, but lasted just 2 minutes and 24 seconds before being sent off for a reckless tackle. Over the past 18 years, only four players have been sent off quicker after coming off the bench in the gun, among them Andre's younger brother, Jordan. Uh, Lons have climbed from the relegation zone to sixth place, continuing their impressive run of form that has seen them win three of their last four league matches. Elie Wahi gave them the lead within 11 minutes, but he was sent off before the break alongside Clermont Foot's Alidou Saidou. Adrian Thomasan doubled the advantage after the break, and Wesley Said sealed the deal in the 82nd minute, 
Big test coming up for Lance at Arsenal on Wednesday. Uh, the biggest match of the weekend, however, saw PSG beat Monaco 5-2 as Ousmane Dembele scored his first goal for Les Parisiens. PSG have won six in a row in the league. Only Leverkusen have a longer winning streak with seven in Europe's top five leagues. Apart from their recent 2-1 defeat to Milan, PSG have scored at least three goals in each of their last seven matches. And they sit one point above Nice, six above Monaco, and seven above Lille. Luis, it's safe to say that this has been a transitional campaign for the defending champions. But what have you made of the start to the Luis Enrique era? And overall, just how important is Usman Dembele going to be for PSG this season? Well, let's focus on that first part of your question uh, there, ZL. It's a work in progress, and I think Luis Enrique would actually admit to saying that. He actually did say it uh, in the preview to the game against Newcastle United. And we all know what Luis Enrique's um, strategy, tactics, philosophy is all about. We've seen it with the Spanish national team, uh, Barcelona, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very, very focused on possession, obsessed with it to the point of wanting to make sure that he gets as close to 90% in the space of 90 minutes as possible. And you have seen that with PSG during the course of this season and Liga, specifically against weaker teams. Of course, the one against Monaco was about 55%. But to him, it's all about controlling the ball, controlling the tempo, making sure that, you know, this very thriving, this very young looking, this very fresh, this very new type of PSG adapts. And I think that's why he calls it a, a work in progress because it's going to take time for everybody to... Connect, And when I say connection, guys, I'm, I'm talking more about, you know, the cohesion between the midfield and up front. Because Kylian Mbappé is clearly the main target, but around him with, you know, Ramos and, uh, of course, uh, you know, Usmane Dembele, who we'll talk about in a second, with Ugarte in the middle, Vitinha, and obviously Ruiz taken in mind ahead of, like, the injury that happened to Zaire Emery. There's a lot to work on for him to do it. Now, domestically speaking... I honestly don't see anything else but PSU winning this title once again, possibly the double once again. They're just too talented, too good, too strong. And when you have Kylian Mbappé, sometimes it feels like you have 12 players on the pitch instead of 11. At the back, it does worry me a little bit, especially when they lose the ball. And in transition, defensively, they can maybe lose sometimes of that focus, which is actually what happened against Monaco, even though it was 5-2. So it's always going to be this thing where it's like, all right, you score three, we're going to score five. You score two, we're going to score six. It's always going to be that. However, the Champions League still remains a doubt for me. I, I don't see them winning that. Uh, again, I think they're still, as Luis Enrique has said, a work in progress. In the group of death, they've already lost two in the last three. So it, it, it's an issue. Very quickly, Nosmani Dembele. I think he's the kind of player that probably somebody like Ben struggles to, to figure out because Ben is so good with statistics. Ousmane Dembele is the kind of player that his best work actually doesn't show on paper. Like Usually the best end product happens because of something that he just started. He's so, so good at creating nightmares to the opposition, specifically from that right wing. In fact, you saw it against Monaco. He did score that goal, but... I think his most notable moments are when he has the ball, he's one-on-one, -on -one, very different kind of player, but in the same similarity of like a Jeremy Docker where like the defender just wants to like pray and fall to his knees. Ousmane Dembele is kind of the same kind of thing. In fact, the opening goal was a result of a inverted sort of take and an outside shot from Dembele. So I, I think he's great. I think that statistically on paper, you're not going to see what he actually gives on the pitch, which is a hell of a lot more. He just has to stay healthy, guys. Like, that's the end product. But, you know, all, all in all, all good for Luis Enrique. Will they win the Champions League? I don't think so. You said it right there, Luis, right? Work in progress. It's obvious that, you know, so many key players, so many veterans such as Messi, Neymar, Verratti have left the Parc de France over the past few months. But still a lot of talent in this team. Big win for them uh, without Marquinhos or Warren Zaire Emery. With that being said, though, they have a big, uh, big challenge ahead of them as they look to get out of the group of death. I do think that there are still a lot of things that need to be ironed out, especially in terms of defense, as you said, especially in terms of playing out of the back, as we know Luis Enrique likes to do, right? Donnarumma, as, as good of a goalkeeper as he is, Still very limited in terms of possession, right? We saw him uh, cost PSG dearly with by, by giving away that goal against Monaco. 
Um, still a lot of concerns as to their other defenders, right, like Milan Spiniar and their ability to play out from the back. But uh, some good uh, run, of, a good run of form for Les Parisiens. Moving on to the Bundesliga, though, newly promoted Heidenheim shared the spoils in a goalless draw with Bochum, whilst another newly promoted side, Darmstadt, picked up a 1-1 draw at Freiburg. Harry Kane opened the scoring egg after 20 minutes as Bayern held on for a 1-0 win and a six-straight Bundesliga victory. And Kane sits atop the Bundesliga scoring charts with 18 goals, three above Serhu Girassi. Hoffenheim and Mainz shared the spoils in a 1-1 draw, whilst Jonas Wind scored his ninth league goal of the season for Wolfsburg, only for Yusuf Poulsen to equalize after the break for Leipzig. But Rogerio restored their lead in the 66th minute as Niko Kovac's side picked up their first league win since September. Four weeks after knocking Leipzig out of the cup and ending their dreams of three straight DFB Pokal titles, Wolfsburg get a much-needed three points. They sit eighth in the table, two points behind Eintracht Frankfurt, four points behind Hoffenheim, seven behind Leipzig, and eight behind Borussia Dortmund. Dortmund conceded within a quarter hour to Rocco Reitz and allowed Manu Pone to get past their defense uh, and add a second in the 28th minute. BVB, though, stormed back with summer recruits Marcel Sabitzer and Nicholas Fulkrug scoring in the next four minutes, whilst Jamie Bino Gittens gave them the lead before the break, and Daniel Malin sealed the win uh, in the final second. Big win for Dortmund ahead of their trip to Milan. As for Union Berlin, they ended a run of nine straight Bundesliga defeats. Ermedin Demirovic gave Augsburg the lead before the break via the penalty spot, uh, but Kevin Volan's 88th minute equalizer would see Union snatch a vital point at home. Union sit one point above Cologne, one point behind Mainz, and two away from automatic safety. They announced Nenad Bajelica as their new manager, and the Croatians' first two tests will be a must win match against Braga in the Champions League and a trip to Bayern Munich. Uh, the past two matches have seen Serhu Girasi come off the bench. And they've also seen Stuttgart pick up 2-1 wins against Dortmund and Eintracht. Uh, Dennis Undab has scored six of their last eight goals in all competitions. Really impressive start to the season for the Brighton Loney. With him and Girassi in attack, Stuttgart fans can dream of a first Champions League qualification in 17 years. They sit third in the Bundesliga, three points above Dortmund. Five behind Bayern Munich and seven behind Bayer Leverkusen, who continue to prove why they are one of the best teams in Europe right now. Leverkusen took the lead within nine minutes via an own goal and doubled their advantage via Jeremy Frimpong, whilst Alex Grimaldo sealed the deal in the 76th minute. Grimaldo is the first Bundesliga player in the past 18 years to score in each of his first six Bundesliga away matches from home. Uh, that's now seven league goals for the Spaniards since joining on a free transfer from Benfica. Nine goals and six assists in 18 appearances across all competitions. I'm not sure there's a single left back I'd take over him at the moment. Ben, what have you made of this Leverkusen side? Can they keep this going? And just how important is Grimaldo going to be in their title charge? Yeah, um, they've just been they've been fantastic, haven't they? Uh, Xavi Alonso is really, uh, I think, this season coming to his own and. I'll kind of go through those pieces um, more like, is it sustainable? I think it's so sustainable what they're doing because of how he plays is like a balanced system and balanced both kind of symmetric left, right, center, um, but also balanced in terms of the goal scorers. So going back to Girassi in, in Stuttgart, he is the absolute focal player. If he's if he were to get injured and be out of the team for, for five, six, seven games, he is the, the main point of their attack. And Undav is really good. But where would the goals come from besides maybe a few from Undav? But for Bayer Leverkusen, we know they're going to come from literally anywhere. They can come from the left back, uh, from Punk scored as well. So they can come from the right back or the wing backs or whatever. They're going to come from Verts. They're going to be able to come uh, from uh, Hoffman on the right then. But they're also obviously able to come from Boniface. So they can come from pretty much anybody that you would – You, it's just so hard to defend against them. That's what I'm trying to get at. They can come from anyone at any time. They can come from sustained possession. They can come from – uh, counterattacks and it's just impossible to really figure out like as the defending team what do we do right because if some teams are going to be more focused on the right side and you said with PSG going to Mbappe okay well how do we defend Mbappe goals are gonna to have to come from somewhere else if we can then shut down this one player or maybe this one 
vital cog at, you know, who's really good at crossing. We can shut them down. You can't do that with Leverkusen. And I think that's where um, you get Grimaldo being so important to the team is that he's able to slot in and go and be that, that balanced cog on the left side. He can, he can assist. He can, I think he's got what, four assists maybe, but he's got, he's got seven goals. So he's contributed a lot, not only scoring himself, but also creating. He's also able to go up and down the pitch, um, which is something that, that, I mean, Alonzo's team is like a transition team in a transition league. So you need players that are able to burst up and down for 90 minutes uh, and for Xavi Alonso's team, pretty much every single game, week in, week out. I mean, there's not a whole lot of like massive rotations or whatever. So you need someone like him that's able to be that that energy down the left side that is able to uh, be that balancing act for those cogs that are in the middle and then on the right side as well. Because Hoffman is really good on the right with Firm Pong to be able to be that 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 player on the right side, uh, creating and scoring as well. And then Ferts also on the left side too helps out um, Grimaldo. So I think that's really where he kind of comes in, right? Is that that balancing act so everything is is symmetric, everything is able to be impossible to to figure out and and I think also then goes into sustainability because it's it's the whole team. The whole team is doing so well as a system instead of all on the backs of one player or all on the backs of just the manager. The manager is getting the most out of every player to do, you know, their most. And Ben, you're someone who works uh, with data for a living, right? You're someone who really knows how to pour over these stats and get to the underlying data I, you know, it definitely warms my heart as somebody who's really cheering for Leverkusen to end the Bayern dominance. Uh, I do think that this is going to be a, a title race down to the wire. You know, Bayern are not going to quit, especially with Harry Kane continuing to find the back of the net. But Leverkusen, they're, they're just showing such an impressive run of form that that is sustainable, right? Three straight clean sheets, including that recent win against Werder Bremen. And as you mentioned, right? Even if you stop Victor Boniface, even if you stop Florian Wirtz or Jonas Hoffman, you still have to deal with their players coming off the bench, like Amin Adli and Adam Plozik. You've still got to deal with probably the deadliest wingback duo in football. Right now, though, do you think that Leverkusen are going to be able to keep up this push until the end of the season? Let's not even say, let's not even say win the title, right? Because Bayern Munich, they're they're inevitable. I still think they're probably going to end up winning it. But in terms of taking this down to match day 34 and and remaining in the fight up until the final whistle, how convinced are you of their abilities? Uh, in short, I would say very. Um, I don't see anything yet that tells me that this is unsustainable. This is coming from both... Um, watching them as well as then going into the data. Uh, I think I posted something last week about the Bundesliga teams and their overperformance of XG, which is a big a big way that I like to look at sustainability in terms of results. Uh, they don't have anybody that's really like completely, even Boniface who scored a lot of goals, right? I mean, what is it, seven or so? So many of them, they don't, they're not overperforming to such an extent that that they, like Harry Kane or um, Garassi, even though for Harry Kane, it's normal. But for Leverkusen, like it's right now, this is what seems to be normal for them. They're slightly overperforming, but they're not drastically overperforming. So to me, I think it's I think it's very sustainable. And they've only been held to a single goal once all season in all competitions, and that was the the really late penalty in Azerbaijan. I think it was it was one nil. It was like a ninety fourth minute penalty. Other than that, they scored at least two goals every single game, and they've won every single game in all competitions except for that Bayern draw that was two two. So I don't see anything performance data results wise that, that tells me it's, it's unsustainable let me just Luis, quickly I, yeah i just wanted to quickly conclude it by by just echoing everything that you guys have been talking about there's two things that i look at by leverkusen when i think about to that question zach can they do this can they dethrone Bayern munich or uh, borussia dortmund the short answer i think lies in two points one of them is coming up which i think is this december schedule I think if they can sustain this December schedule and make it all the way just for that winter break, then I think the chances of them doing this goes from, holy crap, like this is a very good team by Xavi Alonso to they're going to win this thing. Because I think that the issue that lies within, definitely from professional leagues, whether it's the Bundesliga, Serie A, the Premier League, the Liga, whatever, it's not just longevity, but it's longevity and making sure that your squad remains healthy. Because when I look at that midfield, 
And then look at the likes of Granite Shacker, who's completely retransformed himself under Xavi Alonso, right? Or Palacios as well in that middle. Like, mm. if both of them get hurt for a sustainable amount of time, then there's a few issues. Now, granted to Ben's point, like, really, the biggest star here is not even a player. It's Xavi Alonso and the, the ability to how he's been yeah. able to adapt. As a player, he was able to adapt, whether it was for Liverpool or Bayern Munich or whatever player or, you know, whoever he played for, he always just was able to adapt. And he, it's amazing that he's done that as a manager. But to me, the key is December. Get through December, keep healthy, and then, holy crap, man, the sky's the limit. It would be amazing to see definitely the best young manager in Europe uh, win this trophy. It would be incredible. Yeah, I mean, that's a very unique point that you bring up, uh, Luis, because, right, so many impressive players, so many impressive youngsters as well as veterans like Granit Xhaka and Robert Andrik, but the star of this team is Xavi Alonso, very similar to... Uh, Right when Sporting broke their 19-year title drought a few years back, and the star of that team, uh, apart from any other player like Pedro Porro or Sebastian Coats, was Ruben Amorim. So yeah, you know you, I, I know that you were there to witness uh, Leverkusen throw away that treble what 22 years ago, uh, and and you know throw it away in a few weeks. But this could be the year that the Neverkusen tag ends once and for all. And the first year in the 21st century where Leverkusen pick up a major trophy. But yeah, as you said, they need to get through uh, this, this busy um, uh, Bundesliga period in, until the winter break. And when that happens, you know, I, I'd be very interested to see if they try to uh, invest in some loan signings and some transfers because they are going to lose a few key players uh, for AFCON, such as Odilon Kusunu, Edmund Tapsoba, their Nigerians, right, with uh, Boniface Nathan Tella. So a lot of key players leaving for the Ivory Coast, but uh, I do think that this team's form is certainly sustainable. What a what a what a season! And he just makes it right? happen, right? He makes it happen. Yeah. Musa Diaby left for Aston Villa. It didn't matter. Like they, they just figured it out. It's incredible. By the way, thank you for making me feel so old. Yes, two thousand and three. <laughs> I graduated from university. That's how old I am back then. <laughs> you so you were in university when Leverkusen were when yeah. they blew it. Okay. Yeah. I was about to say, uh, Luis, you were a teenager when this happened. I'm glad I didn't. Oh, because... well, well, then I like you even more now, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that there's a genuine argument to be made that Grimaldo is the best Spanish player who have never played professionally in Spain. He developed at La Masia, but began his senior career at Benfica, winning four league titles in seven years. Can he lead Leverkusen to their first league title? All eyes are on Xabi Alonso's side, who are the only Europa League side to have won every single match so far. They'll be looking to wrap up first place in their group with a win at Haken before hosting Borussia Dortmund. I want to switch gears to a li to La Liga, though. Alaves won their second straight home match and beat Granada 3-1 in a battle between two newly promoted sides. Whilst Valencia drew 0-0 to Celta de Vigo as Rafael Benitez returned to his former stomping grounds. Julian Jose opened the scoring within 19 minutes as Real Betis beat Las Palmas 1-0. Real Sociedad took an early lead via an own goal before doubling it within 22 minutes, only for Yusuf and Nesiri to pull one back at the hour mark for Sevilla in a battle between two Champions League sides. Sevilla continued to push for their sixth straight draw in the league until the 88th minute when Sergio Ramos and Jesus Navas both saw red. Marcelinho uh, returned for a second spell at Villarreal seven years after leaving the Yellow Submarine, becoming their third permanent manager of the season. And he got off to a winning start as Jose Luis Morales' hat-trick saw them beat Osasuna 3-1. Unai Lopez gave Raya Vallecano uh, the lead before the break, but a late own goal would see Barcelona come away with a point in Vallecas, whilst Antoine Griezmann's 64th-minute goal saw Atletico Madrid beat Mallorca 1-0 and pick up their 18th consecutive home win in all competitions. Atletico sit level on 31 points with Barcelona and four behind Real Madrid with a game in hand on both. Girona can reclaim top spot if they beat Athletic Club today, 
All eyes are on the Catalan side as they look to pick up their seventh straight win in all competitions. Uh, Largi Ramazani opened the scoring within seven minutes for Almeria, but Mason Greenwood and Borja Mayoral's goals would see Getafe enter the break on top and come away with a 2-1 win. Almeria are the only team in Europe's top five leagues who have not won a single league match this season. Real Madrid have won five of their last six in all competitions, with Rodrigo grabbing a brace in their trip to Cadiz before setting up Jude Bellingham's goal. Luis Bellingham has grabbed most of the spotlight with his 11 goals, but Real truly have something special with Rodrigo, 22 years of age, and already making a massive difference in attack for Los Blancos. Just how high is the ceiling, and can he lead Brazil back to the golden days? It's so high, Zag, that I'm actually pissed off he plays for Real Madrid. Because if he, if he played for another club, we would just be talking about Rodrigo just as much as Vinicius Jr., uh, or some other young players. He is a tremendous talent. And I've been following his career for a very long time. Uh, it's, it's weird. Every time I join, when I used to work for Sports Illustrated or CBS, usually my first ever article, I, by chance, I guess, happens to always be about young Brazilians. For SI, it was Vinicius Jr. literally as he was arriving to Europe. And I did the same thing for Rodrigo when I was at CBS, and, and, and he's 22, like you said, and, it, and it's unbelievable. The, the thing about him, there's a few things. One, if, if you didn't see this game, if you're listening or watching this last game, Rodrigo's goals and his impetus in this match was just ridiculous. The fact that he's 22 is disgusting. And yes, Jude Bellingham absolutely deserves all the attention right now, but Rodrigo consistently keeps on doing this and supplying. And he's kind of the perfect Carlo Ancelotti type of player because Ancelotti is the kind of player, the manager that says, let them just be themselves. And that's exactly what Rodrigo does. He kind of begins on the left, but then he like casually dances his way into the box and then becomes all sort of their false nine. And then he actually becomes their striker. He can cross, he penetrates, he's fearless. And he's not that big. He's not that fast. He's not, he's just so agile, a bit like a dancer. And it's a shame and Credit to Fernando Denise for, for winning Copa Libertadores, but he's definitely got a lot of homework to do in order to get this Brazilian national team to do what he wants them to do because it's not happening. And Rodrigo is played in a different way for the Brazilian national team. He kind of plays him more centrally. Uh, he wants him to be sort of the architect, but it's not really working because he's kind of uh, compounded to a certain sort of area. Whereas for Real Madrid, it's the complete opposite. Carlo Ancelotti gives him that paintbrush and he just goes, paint, man, just paint. And that's exactly what he does. Now, the statistics don't always support just how great he is. He's got, but so far early in the season, five goals, four assists, that's really good. But in the past, when you look in past seasons, I'm just looking right now as I'm talking to you, nine goals, eight assists in 2022, 2023, four goals, four assists in 2021, uh, 2022. So it, you can tell the narrative there, right? He splits evenly. He's good in both sides without being incredible. And that's why I said I'm kind of annoyed he kind of sometimes plays for Real Madrid because they have so many stars. With Jocelyn being the central target now and no longer Karim Benzema, it's time for Rodrigo to really up those numbers. And that's exactly what he's doing this time around. It's just that nobody expected, I mean, everybody expected Jude Bellingham to do well. But for him to be leading the charts in the league, it's absolutely ridiculous, especially as an attacking midfielder. But Rodrigo is an absolute talent. He's the kind of player that I would love to see in the Bundesliga, actually, or, or, or even, you know, selfishly, just because I cover it more so than anything in the Premier League, because he's just so versatile. So does everything depend on him in order for Real Madrid to succeed? No. But do they get an extra sort of level of threat when he's on the pitch and he plays well, regardless whether Vinny Jr. is there or not? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm a big fan. Let, let's hope he continues. 22 years old. This is what we have to remember. It's ridiculous. 100%. And I think that, you know, Real, they still need to find that answer at the center forward position. Is that going to be Endrick, uh, who's still, what, just 16 years of age coming in uh, next year, I believe? But is it going to be Mbappe? I, I don't know. But apart from the Mbappe saga, so many promising talents in this Real side who are doing it at the top level. Camavinga, Rodrigo, Vinicius, Chouameni. The future is now for Los Blancos. And I do think that Rodrigo, he's in an interesting position, right? Because uh, over the past year, 
the the rumors have been Carlo Ancelotti going to leave Real in the summer of 2024 and uh, take charge of Brazil after the Copa America. Now, though, the chatter is that Ancelotti is actually going to renew, potentially leaving Brazil to uh, weigh up whether to stick with Fernando Diniz or go with someone else. But a uh, very interesting spot for him to be in. I want to talk a little bit about Ancelotti's uh, home country, though. It's in Italy. And, uh, and discuss the action in Serie A. Just a few weeks after reaching 200 Lazio goals, Ciro Immobile became the first Serie A player to reach 100 away goals in the competition, but their lead did not last long, as Grigoris Castanos leveled things up in the 55th minute, whilst Antonio Candreva gave Salernitana the lead shortly after against his former side, and they would hold on for their first Serie A win of the season. Alongside Marcelino and Julian Stefan, another manager who returned for a second spell over the international break was Walter Mazzari, whose Napoli side would take the lead before the interval as Quicha Quaracchelia opened the scoring, but Adamola Lukman would equalize shortly after for Atalanta. They looked set for a draw until the 79th minute when substitute Elgif Elmas restored their advantage and secured the win. Matsari is unbeaten in each of the seven times he was called upon to lead a uh, team in Serie A with five wins and two draws in his uh, seven openers. But he has got a daunting fortnight ahead of him that will see Napoli face Real Madrid, Inter, Juventus, Braga, and Cagliari, who took the lead within 10 minutes via Alberto Docena, only for Mirko Maric to equalize within the hour mark. Uh, that's now three 1-1 draws in their last four matches for Monza. Over in Empoli, Francesco Caputo uh, opened the scoring against his former side via the penalty spot, but Andre Andrea Pinamonti found the back of the net against his former club in the 12th minute and leveled things up. Uh, Sassuolo would take the lead within... Uh, Sassuolo took the lead via Mateus Enrique, only to cough up the advantage shortly after, with Domenico Berardi restoring their lead via a spot kick, but Empoli drew level in the 86th minute via an own goal. Once again, Berardi stepped up to the plate and delivered a 92nd minute winner. That's now seven goals and two assists in, a, in 11 matches for the Italian winger, one of the greatest one-club men of his generation. Uh, we saw plenty of late drama throughout Serie A, including in Frosinone. Matias Sule gave the host the lead within 34 minutes, but Ruslan Malinowski evened things up immediately after for Genoa. Since making his Serie A debut in 2019, Malinowski has scored 16 goals from outside the box. Only one player has scored more in Europe's top five leagues, Lionel Messi with 23 the two teams looked headed for a draw until the 94th minute when Ilario Monterisi scored the winner for Frosinone. Gianluca Mancini broke the deadlock early on for Roma, but Florian Tovan leveled things up within the hour. Udinese looked set for a ninth draw in the league until the 81st minute when Paolo Dybala completed a lovely combination move and restored Roma's advantage while Stefan El Sharari sealed the deal shortly after. Milan were without Olivier Giroud, Rafael Leao, and Noah Okafor, but they nevertheless picked up a 1-0 win against Fiorentina as Theo Hernandez opened the scoring from the penalty spot before halftime. First clean sheet for Milan since October 7th. As for Fiorentina, they coughed up a golden opportunity to move into the Champions League positions, and they sit 7th in the table, level on 20 points with Atalanta, one behind Roma, four points behind Napoli, and six points behind Milan. The biggest match of the weekend, however, came in the Derby d'Italia. Both teams fielding back threes and striker partnerships. Federico Chiesa found Dusan Blahovic for the opener for Juventus in the 27th minute, with the Serbian striker ending a 71-day goal drought. But it didn't take uh, Inter too long to respond, as Marcus Turam set up Lautaro Martinez's equalizer, as the two sides settled for a 1-1 draw in Turin. Inter sit atop the league table, two points above Juve and six above Milan. Still a long way to go as they look to win their 20th Scudetto, but it's safe to say that things could have gone a lot worse for the Nerazzurri. Ben, what did you make of this one, and what were your biggest takeaways from both teams' performances? 
Um, well, what I made of this one was it was definitely um, a lot going on. I think that Juventus are definitely happier to get this draw because you can see after they scored, they kind of were a little bit adventurous for a minute, and then they conceded, and then they're like, no, okay, we're done. We're done playing this game. I just want 1-1 and go home. And they did that. They successfully did that. Um, and I think especially the second half, Inter had a lot of difficulties, a lot more difficulties, I should say, breaking down like Juventus's block. I mean, they really were kind of like, okay, like we're going to 5-3 and we're going to try to not like go up and press, but we're going to try to do a little bit of stuff. But really, we're just going to try to hold this uh, when Inter were a lot more adventurous. Um, so, and I think that Inter did try to win. I think they really did try to say, hey, we want to go well ahead of you in the table. These are obviously the two best teams by by a lot. I think you watch them also by points tally. Um, but I think Inter really wanted to, despite it being an early, se- I guess, early season, mid-season game, right? It's not right at the end. So a lot could happen. They really did want to try to get this win. So I think Juve is going to be a little bit happier. Um, I think also they, they Nicolucci was it in the middle. I think it was his first start for Juve. I think that it's such a big game as his first start. There was a lot of mistakes. I think that they had a lot of possession that they could have made more with. Um, but when he he came out for Loc- when Locatelli came on, I think it was a lot easier. But at that time, they weren't really trying a whole lot more. They were really just trying to you know make sure they can keep possession for a little bit and make sure it's not you know they don't concede. Um, so I think if he had done a little bit better, maybe the game would have been a lot more open because maybe they would have tried more. But I think that there were some difficulties in the midfield of really trying to keep the ball to then move it up the pitch. And had they been able to do that, I think they would have tried to do more. But I mean, it was a great game. I mean, he's at Vlahovic. And then like a couple of minutes later, it was almost the exact same goal uh, to Ram to Martinez. Martinez's movement was just um, sublime, though, because you could see, you could see what is it um, Gatti that he beat, right? That he he faked to go far post, and then right as the ball is kicked, he went near post. There's a connect. Obviously, they knew that Taram was going to do that, and then you see Gatti. If you watch it, a replay from kind of Taram's angle, you can see him almost like, oh, oh my god, where did you come from? Because he came from behind Gatti, and he's able to score. Um, so it was a great piece of movement by him, classic Martinez, but. But yeah, I think it was, it was a great game, uh, one to watch. And I think being the two best teams, being a draw is, I think, fair. And you, I think, definitely did a good job to, to lock that down. 100%. Yeah, I agree that Nicolucci did struggle somewhat. But uh, very telling w- with regards to Juve's situation, right? They've lost Pogba and Fagioli to these long-term suspensions. They were without Timothy Weah, as well as a few other players, I believe. Still able to get a draw, but uh, with without a doubt... Locatelli coming on made a huge difference. Uh, we also saw Juan Cuadrado come on for uh, Inter and booed with every single touch, <laughs> completely firing up. I thought I thought that he was, yeah, he had an interesting performance, Cuadrado, right? 35, I believe, and uh, definitely in the twilight of his career, but still fired up, got himself a booking, and uh, had an interesting um an interesting play where he he could have easily gotten a second yellow but there was another one where i think he he rode the contact a shoulder barge from moise kane uh kept going and then ended up uh diving from alexandro's foul got sandro booked i believe it was um so you know it's not easy to come off the bench and be booed with every single touch of the ball but i thought quadrado Mm -hmm. did okay all things considered um, I want to turn our attention now to the Premier League, guys. Luton Town picked up their first win since, since September with Tedden Menji opening the scoring in the 72nd minute only for Michael Olise to equalize immediately after for Crystal Palace. But Jacob Brown restored the Hatter's advantage in the 83rd minute at Kenilworth Road. Jay Rodriguez opened the scoring for Burnley after the break via a penalty. They looked headed for their first win since October 3rd until the 86th minute when Dara O'Shea scored an own goal whilst Thomas Sukek uh, gave West Ham the lead in the 91st minute, sealing a 2-1 victory. Burnley are the second team in the history of English football to lose each of their first seven home matches, along with fourth-tier Newport County some 53 years ago. Bournemouth picked up their second straight league win with Marcus Tavernier, uh, grabbing a brace against Sheffield United, whilst Justin Clybert became the first player in football history to score in the Premier League, La Liga, Serie A, the Bundesliga, Liga, and the Eredivisie. Huge win for the Cherries, who now sit three points above Luton and seven above Sheffield United. Luis, uh, big three points for Bournemouth in an early relegation six-pointer. That's now three wins uh, in four. How impressed? Uh, 
How impressed have you been with them under Andoni Iraola? And overall, what do you think are their biggest areas for improvement? Well, that stat you just told about Justin Clyburn is amazing. I didn't even know that. That's incredible. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question, Zach. I, listen, the thing about Iraola is that, again, just like we, where we, did we begin with Luis Enrique, right? He, he is the type of manager that likes to implement a philosophy and a system that's going to take time. Um, and I think that's really the reason why he's here, actually, because Bournemouth know that they need an identity that is not just sustainable, but I think they're tired of, especially under new American ownership, they're tired of living in the waters of, you know, fighting above relegation or even getting relegated. So, you know, that comes in and, he, and he's trying to implement this possession centric, uh, strong midfield, wide dynamic based attack. And obviously, that's going to take time. There's a lot of talent in this Bournemouth side. Like, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, Justin Clivert is somebody that's finally getting getting used to the Premier League. Uh, he's not, you know, not lighting it up as of yet. Obviously, never going to be like his father, but he knows that. I, I've talked to him a bunch of times. He's a good guy. He's a hardworking player. And he, he still has to learn the system. Good to see him get his goal against Sheffield United. But he's a kind of, you know... He plays in the sort of front three line behind Solanke, where, again, just like how Brazil want to use Rodrigo, it's the same way with Cliver. Then Semenyo, the striker that came from Bristol City, he's another great talent. He's on the right wing with um, Lever uh, Tavernier on the, on the left and then Solanke up front. And, and then after that, it's really just about sending a foundation. So the answer to your question is, I've been very impressed when they won against Newcastle. That was a very big win. They, uh, to be fair, Newcastle really didn't look that good that day, but Bournemouth took full advantage. It's great to win away from home. If you want to stay in this Premier League, you have to win away from home, and that's exactly what they're doing. So little by little, they'll get there. I, it's going to be very difficult for them to break in the top 10. It's, I, I don't see it happening anytime soon, but you know, um, it's good to see a good young Spanish manager do his thing. Uh, with a team that's hungry and, and ready to do it. But, you know, little by little, step by step, they'll take care of business. So, so far, so good. They're not going to get relegated. They're not going to get into Europe. But, you know, hopefully they'll be able to revitalize something strong. And maybe in the next few seasons, they could, they could challenge for something bigger. But as of now, it's a project in progress. Over in the city ground, we saw a firecracker of a match. Anthony Alonga opening the opened the scoring within three minutes for Nottingham Forest, but Evan Ferguson leveled things up shortly after. Joao Pedro gave Brighton the lead and added another from the penalty spot, but Forest were given a lifeline after Lewis Dunk was sent off, with Morgan Gibbs-White pulling one back from the penalty spot. The Seagulls fought hard despite being down to 10 men for a half hour. They ended up securing their first league win since September uh, Brighton have now scored and conceded in 17 straight top flight matches. You'd have to go back 63 years to find the last time that a team did that. Uh, Luis, big win for Brighton against a feisty Forest side. That's now 11 go league goals for Ferguson in 2023, the most for a teenager since Wayne Rooney in 2005. What's it going to take for Brighton to sort out their defensive issues? And overall, how important is Ferguson going to be for their ambitions? Well, Evan Ferguson was ridiculous. He's an absolute talent, and he reminds me of... It's funny that you say Rooney, because he does remind me of this sort of killer instinct. I'm going to get the job done no matter what. And he's doing exactly that. He's actually the perfect type of teenager to learn under somebody like Roberto de Servi. He's, he's perfect. Uh, to answer your question about the defensive issues, well, if, if people uh, hopefully knew why Lewis Dunn got sent off, it was two yellows. And the second yellow was reportedly because he went up to Anthony Taylor and he called him an F in balance. So uh, <laughs> and it was hilarious because if you look at the videotape, you have, uh, I can't remember who it was, but it's Lewis Dunn's teammate going to the ref going, why are you giving him a second yellow? And the ref saying, because he called me an F and then he sent him off. So the, in, in a very De esque type of uh, style, Lewis Dunk gets sent off. And listen, here's the issue with Brighton this season. Everybody knows how good they are. Everybody knows how smart they are. Everybody knows how strong they are under Roberto de Servi. 
They're very good tactically. But the problem is when you lose the likes of somebody like Alexis McAllister, Moise Kaisel, you have to restart again. And that's exactly what uh, the Serbi said this summer. It's going to be tough. Add to the fact that you're in the Europa League. Like that's just going to be a lot of work for a club that whose entire cultural ethos is on finding young raw talents from anywhere around the world, making them gems, and then sort of recycling that all over again. So it's going to be very difficult, especially in this Premier League season, which in my opinion, it's not even an opinion, it's a fact, you could just see it, is the most competitive when it comes to getting these European spots, especially the Champions League. So it's going to be very difficult for Brighton, but it's not because they're not a good team. It's because in the Premier League, you either come to fight or you die because you need the money, you need the resources. And when you play in Europe, it's going to be that much harder. It's great to have Ansu Fati in here. I think he's a big help. Edingra is a ridiculous talent. Lalana is doing his thing. But like when I look at the bench and I see the likes of, you know, Facundo Bonanote, who's good, Baleva, Moder, Joao Pedro, Henshaw Wood, you know, are they solid? Is it European caliber? Can they make it into a top five? I don't think so. But it's got nothing to do with how good the Serbi or Brighton are. It's just it's just the nature of the beast. You lose a Caicedo, you lose a McAllister, like you're going to lose matches. Uh, Mitoma being injured, obviously, is not helping either. So they're a great team. They'll definitely be in the top eight, I would say. But... It, Depends how well. If they can win the Europa League, boom, that, that's fantastic. So we'll see what happens. Speaking of top eight teams, uh, we saw an epic game in North London. Tottenham missing a lot of key players like Yves Bissouma and James Madison. Playing with a back four composed entirely of fullbacks, but they took the lead within 22 minutes. Giovanni Lo Celso had played under Unai Emery at PSG and Villarreal, and he gave Spurs an early advantage, but Emery's side would come roaring back as Pau Torres equalized before the break for Aston Villa, and Ollie Watkins completed the comeback at the hour mark. Uh, we've got a Tottenham fan and a Villa fan on the show, but I want to start by going to our Spurs supporter. Tottenham are the first Premier League team in nine years uh, to lose three straight matches despite taking the lead in each game. They're the first team to go unbeaten in 10 league games and uh, lose their next three. Ben, Tottenham have, uh, excuse me, the first Premier League team to do so. Ben, Tottenham have gone from top of the table uh, to outside of the top four. What goes up must come down and Spurs are falling fast. What did you make of this performance, and how confident are you in your team's ability to shake off this injury crisis and get back to winning ways? So it's an interesting question because what I make of the performance is really good. Um, and despite the loss, look at how much we created in terms of offside goals. And <laughs> I mean, I think we, I think Sun got like like a hat trick um, if if this was in 1980 and they didn't have VAR. So I really think that the performance is really good because. And this is this has actually happened. I think all the losses that we've had this season is that we we play like I'm going to call it well. And this is you know with me not remembering literally every d detail of every match we've lost this season, but we play well. But we create right. And what have we had such a difficult time doing the past five and a half years since the since since even that Champions League run that that Poach was in charge of create. And so we're actually able to now create. Um, one issue that I will say is that one of the reasons we're able to create so much is we finally have our Christian Eriksen replacement in James Madison, who was who was out, and he's out for a bit. So the fact that we were still able to create with him gone and create so much against a good team, um, I mean, any Emory team is going to be good, but against this Villa team, that, that to me, that's really good. Um, we were able to really put Villa on the back foot for, for stretches of the game. Um, I think that mentality-wise... This was one of the few games where we, we did have a shift after we conceded right before halftime. I did see two things. I did see a, a, a slight shift in mentality in the second half versus the first half. Part of that, I think, was because Emery made some really good changes um, it, for the second half that I think nullified where we were able to create from, which is our you know the inverted fullbacks, that central going out wide. So I think it was two-part, both a little bit of like, oh, man, like we just conceded. We shouldn't have conceded that, uh, as well as you know really good um, – switches by Emery to be able to to you know 
do away with one of our best talents. Udogi was a big one, helping to create everything, and they really kind of shut him down. Um, but I think that the performance was, was, was good. The result is obviously bad, but I think given how we played with all those injuries and suspensions, I mean, um, so Betancourt got hurt as well. So so the only the only replacement that we really have for Yves Basuma is Betancourt because Yves Basuma main skill and main role in this is to know when to turn, how to turn, and go up the pitch and bring the ball up from wherever he is, whether that's in basically the center back spot if he's receiving from Vicario or in the you know defensive midfield spot, to turn and beat one, two, or three guys and then move up the pitch, get into the opposition half, and then create. He's not someone who's going to create uh, with creative passes. He gives it to Madison. He gives it to Kulisev. So he gives it to someone else that will do that. And Bendikor is the only other person that can actually carry like that, and especially that can turn like that. We don't have anyone else going to do that. So he came out of the game. Um, Hoiberg is a lot better at passing. I think a lot of people give him credit for, but he's he's not the best turner or carrier. Uh, Skip is is a solid option, but he's not really the best carrier of the ball. So those were then the two that we're having to deal with. So I think if he's gone for a bit, that also is going to cause a lot of problems because Lewis also played really well, but he's also not the carrier. He's the passer. So he's the James Madison replacement. I don't think Tottenham with Ainge right now can – do as well as we did at the start of the season if we don't have someone, basically if we don't have Basuma or Bentancur to be able to turn to beat three players, two players, and carry the ball up the pitch. That's what we used to do with Musa Nebele. We used to be able to turn and, and move and get up past the strikers, past the wingers, and get up into that final phase. Without them, that's kind of the biggest thing with injuries. I think Romero's a big miss, but... and, and So Romero's a big miss, Vanderbilt's a big miss, but the main miss for me... Um, I was in Madison, but I think it's Basuma. So when he comes back in, that's going to be, I think, the most important thing that that will tell me what I need to know about this injury crisis. Can we go through it, or are we going to lose through it? Luis, it's been just over a year since Unai Emery replaced Steven Gerrard with Villa, hovering above the relegation zone. But today, they occupy the top four for the first time in 14 years. Huge win for the villains. They managed to turn things around after a shaky first half, Emery making a bold double substitution at the break. Wanted to get your thoughts on Emery's tactical adjustments as well as Ollie Watkins. That's now seven goals and six assists in 13 league appearances. We've seen Emery work his magic with so many strikers like Gerard Moreno, uh, Carlos Baca, and Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. We're seeing it once again with Watkins, who is in the prime of his career at 27. Such an effective player when it comes to getting into the box, holding up the ball, uh, amid pressure and making those lung busting runs past the defense just how important is Watkins for this team and where does he rank amongst the best strikers you've seen at Villa Park Woo! what a question um I, obviously I've been following this beautiful club for a very very long time so it, it's a high order I've got some heroes of mine including Dwight York before he went to Manchester United and Juan Pablo Angel, the Colombian, who was great. Savo Milosevic, Christian Benteke. Like, there's just so many great strikers through the years. Ollie Watkins is definitely up there, and he could, by the end of his career, depending on how long he stays with us, definitely be regarded as one of the greatest and obviously helping us to hopefully win tri tri titles and get as high as we can. You mentioned, here's the thing about Ollie Watkins. Again, you know, the same thing that I was talking about, Dembele, different players, but the same argument. The work that he does off the ball is probably the best I have seen in the Premier League in a very, very long time, off the ball. And because his work off the ball is often unnoticed, specifically by a certain England manager, then <laughs> the problem here is that we just focus so much on his goals and his assists, which is clearly he's a striker. Goals are the most important statistic that we need to rely on. But he does so much to lead the defensive unit that he almost becomes two people. And now when you have Musa Diaby next to him in recent circumstances, not this one, and we'll go back to the tactical changes that Emery did against Tottenham, then he becomes such a force. He had a little bit of a struggle at the very beginning of the season, trying to find the back of the net, but now he's found his form. He's so clinical. He's got quick feet. He's smart. He's fearless. And he works so well as well with other players around him. And that's a very important thing for Unai Emery's system. You have to run the channels. You have to exploit space. But you also have to hold the ball and make sure that you wait 
to see what can be available to you, whether that's Musa Diaby next to you or Matty Cash on one wing or Lucas Dean on the other one. So those are very key things. I love his attitude. I think he's so smart. I think that goal should have been onside because I just like it's like a toenail. It's just ridiculous. But that's a, that's a VAR argument. It's nothing even to do with Villa. It's just overall, but that's for another day. So he's key. He's fundamental. But just like we were talking about Xavi Alonso, the real star of this team is Unai Emery. What he has done, I've been a fan of this club since I left Peru for England 1992. I've seen a lot. Okay, I've seen Aston Villa come second in the Premier League debut. I've seen John Gregory's Aston Villa when we were top of the table up to Christmas uh, in my senior year in high school. I've seen the Brian Little years when we won the Coca-Cola Cup, which was the last trophy Villa has won, the last major trophy Villa has won in 1996. The Martin O'Neill years, of course. I've seen relegation. I've seen it all. Unai Emery in my lifetime, because I'm not included in 1982, ridiculous uh, European Cup championship because I wasn't uh, a fan then. I was only one year old. But Unai Emery in my lifetime is the best thing that I've ever seen for Aston Villa because of what happens whether we lose or draw. You mentioned the statistics that were fourth. How about this? 77 points in the first 38 league matches for Unai Emery. Before him, the 38 league Premier League matches, it was 44 points. 22 Premier League wins in 2023. That's a club record. Like, I think only Manchester City and Liverpool can, to, can, can, can even call up to that. And he's done it in just a period of a, over a year. He's done it at the same time as trying to, you know, strengthen his English. He's done it in a space of time where things have had to, like, people, injuries, because, you know, Tyron Minks has been injured, Alex Moreno has been injured, Jacob Ramsey has been injured, uh, Emiliano Wendia has been injured, and yet he continues to produce. And I'm so happy, and I'm happy because also he's not an English manager. He's come into this, and he usually gets belittled at the very beginning because of his lack of English and that good evening bullshit comments that he gets every now and again. Like, and now he's come in, and now suddenly everybody's like, oh, look at this. Unai Emery. Wow, what a surprise. Don't be surprised. Look at the body of work that he's done over the years. He's done it over and over and over again. And when people mention Arsenal, let me tell you something. He took over Arsenal the year after Arsene Wenger left. That's almost impossible to do. That's almost impossible to do, to try and get that club to regenerate. But yet, what did he do? He got them higher than what Arsene Wenger did in his last season. So anyway, my point is this. Una Emery's Aston Villa is still a project in progress, and he said it himself. There's clubs better than us that can get a Champions League spot. But now we have a system, we have an identity, we have an educated squad, and the sky is the absolute limit. And it's unbelievable. And we have a spine in Emiliano Martinez, you know, Ezri Consa, Diego Carlos, um, Pau Torres, who is just an unbelievable acquisition. Yuri Tillemans, Bubo Kamara, who, by the way, came on a free. Musa Diaby, Oli Wong. So this is everything is pointing in the right direction. And the great thing is now, even when we lose, we now have a plan. And that hasn't happened for us in a long time. And I'm very proud of it. And it's, it's a support system from the ownership to the staff to the players that allows Unai Emery to shine. So it, it's great to see. I mean, let's see what happens because it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. But the fact that we're fourth right now in the Premier League, it, it shouldn't be a surprise. But at the same time, it should be completely celebrated. It's unbelievable. What a job Emery is doing. And as far as Watkins goes, you know, I think everybody will agree that Erling Haaland is the best striker in England. But as far as number two goes, right, a lot of players in that discussion, Heung-Min Son um, and, you know, Ivan Toney, for example, Evan Ferguson, Alexander Isak. I do think that Watkins is a serious contender for number two. Ben, I know you've got to run soon, but I want to put your expertise uh, to the test as far as the youth football goes. So we've got a lot of interesting action going on in Indonesia in the U-17 World Cup. Despite having 24% possession and five shots to Spain's 22, Germany pulled off a 1-0 victory courtesy of a penalty from Paris Brunner, whilst Ismail Buneb's 83rd minute winner saw France edge Uzbekistan 1-0. Despite that defeat, still a very impressive run for the Central Asian country. They beat Canada, they drew to Spain, and they eliminated England from the tournament. Uh, really impressive run for the White Wolves. 
Mali had scored five goals in back-to-back matches, and this time they edged Morocco one nothing with Ibrahim Diara scoring in the in the third straight match. Uh, Mali will be looking to continue their deep run as they face off against France in the semifinals. Really impressive tournament for them. Ben, what have you made of their form in Indonesia, and which players have caught your eye uh, from this Mali team? Yeah, I mean Mali's been really good. Um... They've had some some crazy results. It seems like right they can, they they can score a lot and, and a lot of times they're not conceding a ton. Um, but they they've been impressive to be able to put this all together. And um, two players, one player that I really like, Seku Kone. Um, he's one of their midfielders. He's been I would I like to so there's some players I like to call like possession facilitators if that makes any sense. Where they're they're not like the players that oh they're going to get like the key passes and the assists or, or the progressive passes, whatever you want to call it. But they're able to play consistently play and accurately play a lot of passes to the correct player at the correct time that's then going to help the their team then create. So they're not necessarily it's not James Madison creating. It's more Yves Basuma like to be able to know, you know, where to play the specific passes. Um, even if those passes themselves aren't the highlight reel. And so I really like him. Um, also, uh, uh, Hamadou Mekalu, I think I really like him as well because he is able to drift wide. He's able to get forward. He loves shooting. I think he scored one goal, but but he, he's taken a lot of shots, though. Um, so he, the argument could be like, oh, he needs to get better shooting. But I think another way to look at is this is a midfielder who's willing to get forward at very young, willing to get forward and willing to take shots, even they might not be from like the perfect positions. Because if you take a shot, if it doesn't go out and it's saved or it's blocked, it creates a lot of danger a lot of times, especially in the U-17 World Cup. You, If you're just able to create danger uh, for the opponents, there can be chaos that ensues and you can get a goal. Uh, so I, I really like him because he's able to create that uh, with a lot of his shots by moving up and down the pitch and helping to yes facilitate the progression element of the game, but also then cause a lot of danger there as well. But yeah, and then, and then also very quickly on Uzbekistan, I, they have been... Fantastic, haven't they? I mean, it's it's something that's a little bit surprising, I think, for a lot of people. But if you look at their youth record, it's not surprising the slightest bit. It's almost expected. the The win against England, I don't know if you can call that expected, but with how well they've done, I mean, they they've uh, systematically put in place for the past several years. And the year of twenty twenty three, you're seeing it come to fruition of their grassroots or development uh, on this U seventeen, U twenty, U twenty three level. Uh, U17 and U20 World World Cups this year, they made it to the round of 16. They're knocked out the round of 16, but they made it to the round of 16. Uh, U23 won bronze in the Asian Games, which is a U23 tournament. And then the U20s won the AFC Youth Asian Cup, which is the main, it's basically like the U20 Euros, right? So they have been able to do that by having good players at all levels, especially around the age right now, 20-ish. The 17 year olds are also really good, but the U 20s are also playing a lot in the U 23s. Uh, and the manager of the U 20 and the U 23 side is also the manager of Olympic Tashkent in the league, which is important to know because that is kind of like the name shows Olympic Tashkent. That is basically a U 23 team. So he's managing a lot of the U 20 and U 23 players week in, week out, and then bringing them to these tournaments. So that's a lot of what how they've been able to actually get this far, you know, with, with a lot of different youth categories. Back to the Premier League, Kai Havertz's 89th minute winner saw Arsenal beat Brentford 1-0 and move to the top of the table, whilst Newcastle bounced back from two straight defeats and thrashed Chelsea 4-1 with Jamal Laskels and Jolinton scoring twice within a minute, whilst Chelsea captain Reese James sealed the deal after being sent off in the 73rd minute. No Sandro Tonali, no Callum Wilson, no Sven Botman, no problem. Eddie Howe's side get a huge three points Luis, what did you make of this match? Uh, and overall, what do you feel is the biggest thing holding Chelsea back from stringing together some consistency? Hmm. Well, I mean, it all begins since Todd Bowley came to the club, right? I mean, there's just been, there's too many cooks in the kitchen. They're too young. There are too many individuals without trying to create some kind of cohesion. I think Mauricio Pochettino is the right manager for this, but it's going to take time. I don't think there's the right balance. I think there's a lot of talent. It's great to see the likes of Raheem Sterling and, you know, uh, find his feet again, uh, so to speak. Uh, Mikhailo Mudrik as well is tremendous. We all know how good Enzo Fernandez is. But I think the issue has been from the very beginning an overspending on certain areas on the pitch that you didn't need. And forget about the lack of 
deepening when it comes to the squad as a whole, not just an 11. Nico Jackson is fantastic, but if you're going to rely just on him for the entire season, then there's a problem. Because that's, that, especially if you're somebody like Chelsea, who presumably, because of your recent history, you want to get a Champions League spot. That's just not going to happen anytime soon. No longer the answer is just spend. It's about spending wisely. And I think that's Chelsea's biggest problem. And the thing is, Newcastle, who are very good at home, took full advantage. So when I look at a Chelsea lineup, I sometimes think, this is a great team if I was playing five a side and I needed to get some highlights on my YouTube channel. But are they going to be able to deliver? Are they going to be able to give me a top five, top four? I don't think, I don't think that's the answer. And, you know, now, sadly, they got a sending off from Rhys James, who just came back from injury, who's a very, very important player for them. Thiago Silva's not getting any younger. You know, there's a lot of tiny little issues that I think Mauricio Pochettino has to deal with. And he said it himself after the game. It's like, look, I, I wasn't happy with what they did, but we have to understand that some of them are young and understand it's like, that's all very well, man, but you're Chelsea Football Club. Like... It wasn't too long ago that you won the Champions League. It wasn't too long ago that you remember the Jose Mourinho years. So what are you going to do to rectify it? I think Pochettino is the right man for it. I think it's, again, it, you know, Manchester City, Liverpool, um, Arsenal, who are leading the Premier League table. And now you have Aston Villa in fourth, fighting with Newcastle as well. Manchester United are looking a little bit better. Like, you want to break that European spot it's going to be very difficult and again i don't see it happening this season chelsea uh humbled and knocked back down to earth this game was there for the taking they let it get uh out of their grasp and overall i think this has been one of this was one of if not the worst performance of the pochettino era another team that are feeling blue both uh literally and figuratively are everton they were a hit with a 10 point deduction in the international break after violating the league's profitability and sustainability rules and their woes continued as alejandro garnacho opened the scoring within three minutes via an audacious bicycle kick marcus rashford doubled the lead from the penalty spot and anthony martial sealed the win for manchester united Everton remain in the relegation zone, but as for United, they end the weekend in sixth place, two points behind Tottenham, four behind Villa and Liverpool, uh, five behind Manchester City, and six behind Arsenal. The biggest match of the weekend, however, came at the Etihad. Erling Haaland scored his 50th Premier League goal in 48 appearances, becoming the fastest player to reach a half century of goals and breaking Andy Cole's record, who achieved it in 65 games. We saw a really intriguing duel between Jeremy Doku and Trent Alexander-Arnold. Doku was a menace as usual on that left flank and completed 12 dribbles, but it was Alexander-Arnold who had the last laugh after equalizing in the 80th minute for Liverpool. Manchester City came within one game of equaling Sunderland's 131-year record, but they nevertheless failed to register a 24th straight win at the Etihad in all comps. As for Liverpool, though, they've, they've avoided defeat in 10 of their last 11 league matches in which they've fallen behind. They bend. They don't break. Luis, what did you make of this game, and what, did you, what were your thoughts on the duel uh, between Doku and Alexander-Arnold? I think that it was a tactical, interesting decision from Jurgen Klopp to have Trent Alexander-Arnold just sit. As, and because obviously in the first half, it was all Man City. And I actually found it incredible that it was only one nothing at the time. And the thing about Jeremy... See, the thing... Man, Man, Jeremy Doku has now added another weapon for, for Pep Guardiola. As, as, as if they didn't need another one. So what happens right now is like, because they're so good in possession, they drag everything to the right. So you isolate Jeremy Doku. So then the ball quickly switches to Doku. But... Jurgen Klopp was like, I'm not going to let you do that in the first half that much. I'm going to put Trent Alexander-Arnold on you, and I'm going to put Mohamed Salah as well whenever it's a problem. Now, unfortunately, just like Thierry Henry said when he was the assistant uh, coach at the Belgian national team, when Jeremy Doku has the ball and he's going up against you, the only thing you can do is one thing, pray. And, and, and Trent Alexander-Arnold just had no answer to the most part. I mean... He is an absolute menace, Doku. 
But luckily, it was only one nothing, And fair play to Liverpool, who kind of kept it at that. And what happened in the second half was, all right, now Trent Alexander-Arnold needs to be more himself. Push up forward, become more of an inverted midfielder as well, and just gamble a little bit. Because at the end of the day, Docker's a beast, but it's now the 60th minute, 70th minute, and legs are getting tired. We can rely on And that's exactly what happened. They held on, they held on. So I think, obviously, Jurgen Klopp is the happier of the two managers of getting away with one point here. I still think the title race is still very much on because Man City didn't get that win. And yes, even though it's November, we can say that right now because I really think that the race for the title and the Champions League spots is ridiculously competitive. And I think that a point should be something that Jurgen Klopp should celebrate about because Man City really should have had their number in the first half. Um, I think they missed Kevin De Bruyne in this game. It's clear because Julian Alvarez had a quiet game. Bernardo Silva's tremendous. But just like Ben has been talking about, somebody that can be an architect over the course of this episode, I think Kevin De Bruyne clearly would have been such a useful addition here. Um, but in the end, Jurgen Klopp, the happier of the two, it's going to be a really interesting title race for sure. And, and now we're about to enter, enter a December where uh, somebody like a, a, a team that plays in Europe as well is playing the likes of eight matches in the course of one month. So this is going to be interesting to see what happens. So, you know, it's all to play for. And obviously Arsenal being the happier of the three teams because after their win against Brentford, they're top of the table. So it's been great. By the way, one quick mention, Alejandro Garnacho's goal deserves just a little bit of an, ep just a little moment here in your show, man. Like it was the most ridiculous goal. The, you want to see a better goal in the Premier League season. And I dare say it was better than Wayne Rooney's uh, over at Kicks. Just because of the level of technique. Maybe in the value of importance, because Rooney's was in the match of the derby, but the way that Garnacho took that was absolutely ridiculous. I also like the celebration as well. It was good. Good yeah. stuff. Insane uh, Chilena, right? Yeah. Just an yeah. incredible... Well, you don't say Chilena in Peru, Zaglo. Okay. You know why. <laughs> why? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. What do Peruvians say to describe it? Well, I know that's the Mexican say, Chilena. What do Peruvians <laughs> Well, we don't say Pile Pil Chilena at all because obviously, uh, you know, the very beginning of that word begins with, 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 with something else. So uh, I, I'll let you, I'll let you Google it and see what we say. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I, I will have to Google that after. Um, <laughs> and we're going to go to you for our final question of the show. Our Argentina began the U-17 World Cup with a 2-1 defeat to Senegal. They've since won three in a row, scoring 15 goals and conceding just one. Claudio Echeverri's uh, hat-trick saw them demolish Brazil 3-0 and book their spot in the semifinals, where they will face off against Germany tomorrow. Then, how impressed have you been with Argentina? And at 17 years of age, could Echeverri be the next great talent to emerge from River Plate's youth academy? Yeah, basically, I've been very impressed um, with Argentina. I want to say how I would describe Echeverri is explosive, right? That's what it seems like he's got in everything. Um, and, and explosive is also just to be able to, you have, a, you have the ball kind of right in front of you, and all of a sudden, it's in the back of the net. And, and it's there in a split second because he's got such raw power too. And I don't even think this is like compared like, oh, he's in the U-17 World Cup so relative to other you know U-17 players. I think this is relative to people. You look at Endrick has the exact same thing. It's like you're looking, you're looking, you're looking. All of a sudden, he's 50 meters from where he just was or the ball is in the back of the net because there's such explosive raw power. And, and that's what I think that he really brings to – his game, that's what he brings to Argentina as well. You have this, this person that's able to just, it's not even just creating something out of nothing, so much of it as it is being that finisher, and not just for a goal, but for a move, for a dribble, for a pass, something that's able to finish this one particular movement. And he can do it, I think, in any any part of the game, which has been really impressive to watch. And so if, if the question is, is he the next one to come out of Reaper Plot? Yes, I, I think he is, because he's he's already out. Right, he's he's already played a little bit for the for the first team, but he's he's already out to the world. Uh, people know who he is, it, even if you didn't know who he was before this. You're obviously watching, you're following, you're seeing news articles, you listen to this podcast, you're kind of knowing who he is now. I think that that it's a definitive yes, and how he develops, uh, I think is going to be really fun to watch because 
He's got something that a lot of people, especially at that age, just just don't have. Guys, they call one... him Diablito, by the way. Diablito. 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 Yeah, little the devil. devil. It's it's mainly because of the Bolivian striker uh, player called Marco Echeverri, who who was also known as the devil. So he's the little devil. But just like Ben said, this kid is, I mean, he sure hands with the devil to have these skills. Like he is <laughs> so good. He's ridiculous. Great player. Guys, this was an absolute pleasure uh, to have you both on. Real quick before we go, any projects or articles or anything that you guys want to shout out uh, before we end this? Go ahead, Ben. I would just, I'm not working on anything in particular. I'm just saying I, I keep following me if you follow me to see all this data stuff. I'm just trying to find a lot more ways to build um, ways to analyze the game, to, to be able to more than just visualize what's happening, to able to go under that and see performances uh, either of players or teams. So, yeah, that's, that's the only thing I really want to shout out. Yeah, no, my only thing is I'm uh, in London and England for pretty much the rest of the season before I go back to New York. I'll be going back and forth. So I'm covering a lot of Premier League, like you said, Zach, at the top, Sports Center, um, ESPN FC, and covering all the good stuff here. And I have my weekly column, Onside Offside, where I say the things that I love and the things that I hate about the week. And by the way, it's Chalaca. In Peru, we don't say Chilena, we say Chalaca because we're so petty, we don't want anything referenced to Chile. <laughs> Chalaca, okay. Next time, <laughs> next time a player scores a bicycle kick, I'm gonna say boom, shakalaka. <laughs> <laughs> You're an adopted Peruvian if you do that. That's good. <laughs> Absolutely, I've got to get me some uh, lomo saltado and uh, oh, chicharro. Now you're talking. Now you're talking. <laughs> uh, ben, you know all about the Peruvian chicken, how they're number one at cooking chicken, right? <laughs> so since moving to D.C., I have seen a ton of Peruvian chicken. I have heard all about it. I have had zero of it. So I Get out feel as though I've just you know, ruined the whole the whole last hour of us, but I, <laughs> I, I have not yet tasted the glory, but I have heard so much about it. And I, my wife and I have literally talked. We need to, we need to go find somewhere and... and actually just sit down and just try it because yeah. everyone talks about it of it being DC, phenomenal. DC has a great Peruvian community. So go out there and do your thing, man. Yep. No, absolutely. Guys, uh, this was an absolute blast. Luis, hope you enjoy the rest of your season covering the Prem. Ben, hope your top team can avoid a fourth straight defeat um, and, and get their crap together. But yeah, without any further ado, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We've got more uh, amazing content for you coming up in December, so definitely stay tuned for the rest of Zach Lowy's European Football Show. Thank you so much, Ben, Luis. Absolute pleasure. And guys, make sure to follow these two on social media. You hey, one like. more thing before you say goodbye, Zach. Everybody should know you do a, a lot of fantastic work, Zach Lowy. Really, honestly. 100%. Your, your passion, your, your detail to passion, your, your, your ability to connect other people. It doesn't go unnoticed, my friend. So really, like, honestly, tremendous stuff. Keep it going. Thank you. That really means a lot. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, this was an amazing episode. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did.